Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ and the continuation of the Summer Youth Series. It's been a great summer, amen? Uh, what a turnout. What some powerful, wonderful lessons, a great theme. I want to thank those. I think John McKenzie and Spencer Ross, those uh, brains that put this uh, theme together. It's been a great summer. Uh, three more Summer Youth Series to go. Uh, look forward to tonight's lesson. Looking forward to tonight's singing. So uh, clear your throats. We've got lots of singing tonight, folks. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, I know it's been a busy summer for everybody. For you all to take the time out on a Tuesday evening to make your way from wherever you are to wherever you're going for the Summer Youth Series says a lot about where your heart is. And we appreciate that. We as adults, we as parents, we as leaders in the congregation look to you, uh, the youth of today, the leaders of tomorrow, and we want to thank you. Thank you for uh, lifting up your voices, for um, bringing your Bibles and listening and uh, applying the lessons to your life. We pray that that will continue on. Uh, we don't want to talk about school starting, but with all the great lessons you've, uh, you've been learning this summer, if it's been at camp or summer youth series, it's our prayer that you will take what you've learned and not sit on it, but walk with it. Apply it to your lives. So thank you uh, for being who, who you are as uh, men and women of God who love the Lord, God Almighty. We're looking forward to tonight. We're looking forward to uh, uh, hosting you. And um, tonight, Paul Cartwright, uh, the minister from Webb Web Chapel Church of Christ, will be our song leader and our very own uh, pulpit minister here, Eddie Parrish, will be delivering our lesson. Uh, tonight's lesson is Teach Me How to Serve. And if you've been watching uh, those congregations that have been hosting the Summer Youth Series this whole summer, they've been doing a great uh, service to us. They have been putting how to serve into practice. We uh, commend every congregation for doing that. Uh, before we get started with our song service, if you would, bow with me in prayer at this time. Our most loving, righteous, heavenly Father, we praise your name. We thank you for this gathering together of the saints. We thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship. We pray as we lift up our hearts, uh, lift up our voices to you, that we honor you in all that we do, that we uh, put aside our worries, Father, and, and leave them there for you, that we uh, know that we are one body, that we, Father, come together uh, as a family, as your children, to love you, uh, to serve you. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, uh, we give thanks to you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for uh, our master, your son, Jesus Christ, for his uh, death on the cross 
and his resurrection, Father, that we may, Father, have hope eternal. We love you. Be with us this hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. It's so nice to know that this many teenagers can get together in the middle of the week. This is great. I'm so thankful to be here tonight. And my one request as we begin singing tonight is this. As if there is something that's weighing you down, there's something on your heart, there's something you're struggling with, this is a great time just to pour that out in song and to lay that at the feet of Jesus tonight. So I ask that you would just do that and give it all you've got this evening. Come, let us sing with joy to the Lord. Let us shout
As uh, John said a little bit ago, we are very grateful to have all of you here tonight from uh, so many different places, and uh, it's good to lift our voices in song and praise our God together, and it's always good to be with Paul. Uh, Paul uh, used to work with the church in Pearland down in the Houston area and uh, <clears throat> attended and uh, served as a counselor and song leader and a number of other things uh, at our uh, Camp Bandina session that Brown Trail attended and also a uh, congregation I was with in Rosenberg. And uh, since he moved up here, it's uh, been good to see him on occasion. So if you haven't met Paul, do that uh, tonight and thank him for coming over from Dallas and leading our singing tonight. When we think about Jesus, <clears throat> we think about some pretty impressive words. Son of God. King of kings. Lord of lords. Messiah. Christ. Savior of the world. The list can go on and on. For a few minutes tonight, I want us to focus on another of those very impressive words, but it may not seem as impressive on the surface. And that word is servant. While all of those other words certainly describe Jesus, so does that one. He himself said in Mark 10, verse 45, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2, verse 7 says of Jesus, He took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men. Tonight our topic is, Teach Me to Serve. And we're in a good place and in great hands as we look at Jesus tonight because there was no better servant and no better teacher than Jesus. Teach me to serve. We'll let Jesus do that tonight as we look at John chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 13. Or you can file this under things the Apostle Paul never said. Turn in your phone to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We're going to look at the first few verses of that chapter and draw about three lessons minimum. Let's get the setting first. John chapter 13, we find Jesus and the twelve. His specially chosen apostles, disciples, in an upper room where they observed the Passover meal and where Jesus took those same elements, two of those same elements from the Passover meal and gave them new meaning. We refer to that as Him instituting the Lord's Supper and that's a good way to describe that. And so Jesus had instructed his disciples on the Lord's Supper. He had enjoyed this celebration with them, this Jewish celebration of Passover. And he's about to give them an object lesson momentarily. But before we talk about that object lesson, I want us to get a little bit more context of some things that had been happening before this event in John 13. Luke, in his gospel account, tells us in, the, in the, the very same context in which he describes these events that take place in that upper room, Luke reminds us that the disciples had this ongoing debate among themselves about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. We read that in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, again, in the same context as Luke tells us about the Lord's Supper being instituted, and these other events. Now, of course, that was nothing new. That's not the only time that this debate is mentioned in Scripture. Luke himself mentioned it earlier, Luke chapter 9. Matthew references it, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. Can you imagine the disciples of Jesus having this conversation more than once? 
even after the Lord had talked to them about that. But they were. They understood that some of those terms that we talked about Jesus being, they understood that he was that king, Messiah, Christ. They may have some misunderstandings as to what all that meant, but they they believed that that's who he was, and rightly so. And so they expected him to come into his kingdom, into his glory. And again, they probably had some misconceptions, it seems, about the nature of that. But they wanted to be close to Jesus in his kingdom. And so among themselves, they were having this back and forth with each other about which one was going to be greatest in the kingdom. Well, Jesus is going to teach them what it means to truly be great. Because after they had finished the, uh, the, the meal, Jesus got up, John tells us, and put aside his outer garment, wrapped himself in a towel, and began to wash the feet of the disciples. Look at that in verse 4, verses 3 and 4. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Who was going to wash the feet? That was a common practice back then. Not so common today, but it was then. You go into someone's house... After walking the, the, the dusty streets of Judea or Galilee or wherever you happen to have been, and you were wearing sandals, feet were going to be pretty dirty. And it had become a custom for a long time that when you went into someone's house, as a show of respect for you being a guest in that home, as a show of compassion toward you as a guest, someone in the home, a servant perhaps, would wash the feet of their guests. Thus far, nobody had washed anybody's feet. Remember, they were borrowing this room, so there, 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 wasn't, a, there wasn't a host, there wasn't a servant that was a part of the household that was going to take care of that chore. So who was going to do it? Matthew? Matthew wasn't going to do it. John? No, John wasn't going to do it either. And you can go down the list. None of those guys were going to do it. And you know why? I told you just a minute ago. They were busy arguing with each other about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. If Matthew takes the step and he goes and gets the basin and starts washing feet, what has he done to his chances of being considered great in the kingdom as they understood greatness? He tanked his chances. If any of those disciples, given their misunderstanding of what true greatness was, if any of them went and took the basin and started washing feet, they're, they're giving up their opportunity to be looked upon by the others as being the greatest in the kingdom. So none of them were about to touch a basin of water and a towel. So who was going to do it? Well, Jesus, of course. Someone said these words about the disciples, and I think they're right on target. They were ready to fight for a throne but not for a towel. What Jesus teaches us in John 13 is to fight for the towel. What are the lessons that we learn from this example of Jesus in John 13? I'm going to give you three tonight. Lesson number one, true servants are properly motivated. True servants are properly motivated. If you want Jesus to teach us how to serve, he's going to start by teaching us to have a proper motivation for whatever service we offer. And we learn that in chapter 13 of John, verse 1. Now, before the feast of Passover, 
Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, catch this part, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And it's on the heels of that statement that we then read about what Jesus did in washing the disciples' feet. His motivation was love. He loved all 12 of those guys, Judas included. His service was properly motivated. That's why he washed their feet. You know, it's possible for a person to serve and not love. It is, isn't it? Didn't Paul write about that? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. I can give all my goods to feed the poor. That's service. But if I have not love, it profits nothing. So you can serve and not have love. I remember, well, I remember more than one occasion, but one comes to mind where, um, where I did that when I, was, when I was a kid. And the reason I'm telling you this is it still haunts me to this day. I still feel terrible about it. Uh, and maybe talking about it might help me feel a little bit better. But I was probably, I don't know, maybe... 11, 12 years old, maybe, maybe a little young, maybe 10. And uh, we had gone, our family had gone to East Texas um, for family reunion, which we did every year to Fulbright, Texas. Raise your hand if you know where Fulbright, Texas is. All right. Hey, a few. Okay, good. I know Bobby does back there. Well, <clears throat> I had an aunt that lived there, and, uh, and she, was, she was up in years, and her yard needed to be mowed. And my mother came to me and said, Aunt Betty Jo's uh, yard needs to be mowed. Why don't you go get the mower and go mow it for her? In my immaturity, I threw a fit because I was on summer vacation. And we were there, we were there, I had cousins to play with. I mean, we had things, we had important things to do that I couldn't be bothered with that kind of thing. Well, <clears throat> my mother ultimately won, <laughs> uh, and I mowed the yard, but I hated every minute of it. Now, did she benefit from my service? Sure, yeah, the yard got mowed. I served in a sense, but I didn't serve with love. It's possible to serve and not love. But you know, you can't love and not serve. 1 John 3, verse 17. If a man has this world's goods... And someone is in need, paraphrase, someone is in need, and you close your heart up to that person. How does the love of God dwell in that person? So you can serve without loving, but you can't love without serving. The Bible tells us Jesus loved his own, even to the end, and it's because he loved them that he served them. True servants are properly motivated. Characteristic number two, Jesus teaches how to serve. True servants are impartial. True servants are impartial. Now, when we started, we, we identified the people that were present in that upper room that day. There was Jesus, and who else? The 12, right? The disciples. And among those 12 would be the disciple whom Jesus loved, as he refers to himself, the Apostle John. Who else was among those twelve? Judas. Judas had not left yet to go out and betray the Lord, but he would leave later. Did Judas leave with clean feet? Jesus washed his feet too. Did Jesus know what Judas was about to do? 
Yeah. But Judas left with clean feet. Jesus served impartially. Are there some people that are difficult to love? Are some people difficult to serve? That's not a trick question. Yeah, it, let's be honest. Let's keep it real, right? All right, yeah, there's some people that are difficult to serve. Are there members of the body of Christ that can be difficult to serve? Yeah. I'm going to name some names. You want to know who's difficult to serve? Brother Cantankerous. Anybody know Brother Cantankerous? He's hard to serve, isn't he? What about Sister High Maintenance? Brother Grudge Holder. How about Sister Social Sandpaper? Brother Full of Himself. Sister Snooty. We've met those brethren, hadn't we? Can they be hard to serve? Can they be difficult to love? If we would be like Jesus, we will love and serve without respect to persons. Because who did Jesus die for? Everybody. Didn't he die for Brother Cantankerous? Yeah, he did. Didn't he die for Brother Grudge Holder? Yeah. You will never look into the eyes of a person who does not matter to Jesus. Everybody matters. He tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Titus 2.11. Jesus, teach me how to serve. Jesus says serve without partiality. You know, God is good to everybody. Isn't he? Didn't Jesus teach that? Matthew 5, 44-ish and following. Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, love your enemies. And do good to those that aren't good to you. Why do that? So that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. In other words, that's, that's the idea there is, if you do that, if you are good to people who aren't even good to you, then you're going to be like your Father in heaven. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Any of you have characteristics of your earthly father? I... I I've had people tell me, people who know my father, that also know me, they've told me before, I see, I see your father in you. I know what they mean by that. My dad was dashingly handsome. I get it. But we, we need to possess the characteristics of our heavenly father. And part of the way that we do that is to emulate him in being good and doing good for people who are not good to us. What did Jesus say about God in Matthew 5, 45 and following? He makes his son, S-U-N, right? The, the, the ball of fire out there. He makes his, it's God's son. He makes his son to rise on the evil and the good. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The atheist that bows his back at the very idea of God still gets rain on his yard. Why? That's God. It's the nature of God. Now, are some of God's blessings safeguarded? Sure. Are some blessings reserved for those that are obedient to God? Absolutely. But there are other blessings that God gives, like the rising sun and the falling rain and things like that, that God gives indiscriminately to the entire world, regardless of how they respond to him. That's God. We want to be like God. We'll love and serve without partiality. That's how Jesus served. Number next, number three, number last. True servants are determined. You want to serve like Jesus? Serve with determination. Go back to John 13 and notice in verses 6 through 9, Jesus comes to Peter. 
And Peter says to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Feast or famine with Peter, wasn't it? It was, all, it was always that way. Jesus comes to Peter. Peter's at, he's already washed some feet, evidently, and he comes to Peter, and Peter says, no, Lord. P Peter finally at least understood, you know what? <laughs> I should have done that. After Jesus started, and he, Peter's getting the idea to some degree, he realizes Jesus is not the one who really needs to be doing that. And so he resists, and he said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will eventually. And if I can't wash your feet, you can have no part with me at all. Well, then just wash me all over, <laughs> Peter says, all right? Peter tried to stand in the way of the service that Jesus wanted to give. But Jesus was not deterred. He served anyway. There are going to be times when folks won't understand or appreciate what you may be trying to do to serve others. You know, Brother Wet Blanket's a member of the church too. What do you do? You serve anyway. You serve with determination. You work with undeterred energy. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, Colossians 3.23. Because after all, that's who you're serving. Jesus teach me to serve. He did. He served with proper motivation, love for his own. He served with impartiality, everybody equally. And he served with determination. Make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Make me one too. Make me a servant. Do what you must do to make me a servant. Make me like you. Do we really believe that? Do whatever you have to do, God, to make me a servant. Do we believe that? Are you ready to remove yourself from the throne of your heart so Jesus can reign there unhindered and unchallenged? That's what it means to be a servant. And so whatever it takes for you in your life, in your heart, whatever it takes to get yourself out of there so that Jesus can be there, do it. It's the only way to live. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you would like the prayers of this group of Christians tonight to perhaps help you to be a better servant, and if you'll let us know that that's your desire, we'll be happy to pray with you and for you. There may be someone in the assembly tonight who's not yet a child of God. And you understand what you need to do in order to obey the gospel. You just haven't done it yet. And you're ready to do that tonight. If that describes you, we're ready. If you'll let us know your desire to obey the gospel, we'll help you do that tonight. Let us stand and sing.
Go ahead, be seated for a minute, if you would. Eddie, thank you for that lesson. I pray that we'll all, each, and every one of us, each and every one of us will take it to heart um, and take our responsibility seriously as being servants to God, that uh, uh, the next time we serve, and I, I hope that's soon, that we will be properly motivated, motivated that uh, we will be impartial, and that uh, we will be determined to, to serve those because uh, God wants us to serve. Thank you for being here tonight, all 440 of you. We got our head count, and uh, thank you for coming from wherever you've come to be a part of this great Summer Youth Series. I encourage you to, next week, attend the Northwest Congregation's uh, Summer Youth Series. Brother J.J. Hendricks and the wonderful congregation there is looking forward to hosting, hosting you all next week. And then we will wrap up the Summer Youth Series the following week, following week after that with the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie. Tonight, uh, we are going to serve you food. It's partly, just a part of why you're here. I know that. But uh, when you are dismissed... Um, that door right there, that exit door is the way you, you, you should go. Um, and what I will do is ask that, uh, I know that Corsicana is here, uh, the West Hill congregation, right? Raise your hands. Anybody as far as Corsicana? Ennis. Ennis is here. So West Hill, Ennis. Yes, sir. Mesquite. Mesquite. Okay, there's three. Uh, Grandview is here. Uh, those of you that are, you know, an hour away or so, I'm going to ask that you go first through the line, okay? Uh, you're not dismissed yet. Don't run. Don't run. Yeah. But uh, we are going to have uh, Brandon, Brandon York, if you make your way forward, Brandon's going to be leading us in a closing prayer. But prior to that, I've asked Paul to lead us in one more song. Uh, Again, as you're dismissed, I'm going to ask you to go through the exit door there. We're going to serve you up deli, deli sandwiches, chips, and, and cookies, desserts, whatever we uh, uh, scrounged up from earlier today, wherever we could find it. But uh, we love you all. We thank you for being here. Uh, at this time, would you stand up, please? And this is something that uh, for the last four summers I've been a part of, a camp, a summer camp. Uh, what we do is we make our way to the middle. Everybody, just make your just sidestep to the middle, and we're going to put our arms around our shoulders, and we're going to sing a song. So make your way. Keep, keep come meet your neighbor there from the pew uh, side you. There you go. Come on over. Sidestep. Sidestep. All right. Keep coming. The sooner you get together, the sooner we'll eat. Squish on through there. Okay. I've asked, uh, I've asked Brother Paul Cartwright to lead us in this song, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. I've asked Brother Paul Cartwright if he would lead us in the song, uh, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. And then afterwards, stay after the, uh, the singing of the song, Brother Brandy York will close us in prayer. Uh, my Brown Trail Youth Group, are you still here? You're actually going to help you make your way after the song and prayer. You go first, but you're not eating, you're serving. <laughs> and then you get to eat at the end of the line. Got it? So, Okay, one quick picture and then we'll sing. Okay, I don't leave this one a lot, so you got to help me out tonight, okay? The Lord bless you.
Would you pray with me? Our most holy Father in heaven, Lord, we humbly bow before your throne of grace with joy, with gladness, with thanksgiving in our hearts, God, thanking you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for all the hearts in this room, God, and for their willingness, their desire, and their choice to come here on a Tuesday night to worship you and to lay all their burdens and cares of the world aside. And we're so thankful for all the hearts in this room, God. We pray that you would be with each of us today, that you would bless us, that you would watch over us as we go home, that you would give us safe travels. Pray, we pray that you would bless the food that's been prepared. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, God, for his sacrifice and coming down to die for us so that we could have hope of spending eternal life with you in heaven one day. We pray that in everything we say and everything we do, that you would be glorified. We pray all these things in your son, Christ Jesus' name. Amen.